What's that? Thunder? Th there's not a cloud in the... Not thunder. Look. In the sky. A light? A ball of fire. It's gonna hit! The Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. Out by Nam Gardner's place. Audio adaptation by Ron N. Butler. West of Arkham, the hills rise wild. There are dark little glens where the trees hang precariously and where thin brooklets trickle, never having been touched by sunlight. There was once a road over the hills and through the valley, but people ceased to use it. The old folk have died or gone away, and the farms and villages are slowly decaying back into dark woods and narrow clearings. When I went into the hills to survey for the new reservoir, they told me in Arkham that the land was evil. Might as well cover it up with water. No one can make a farm up there. Except Dammy Pierce, if you call it a farm. Arkham is an old town full of witch legends, so I thought the evil must be something grandmothers had frightened children with through the centuries. A family died up there of a poisoned well. But when I pressed the townspeople, I found the mystery was not an old story, but something that had happened within their lifetimes. It happened back in the 80s. The old police chief saw it. He could tell you, but he died insane. It's cursed, and you can see where the curse struck. The land is dead all around. The Blasted Heath, they called it. Five acres of gray desolation like a sore eaten in the land. No vegetation, only a fine gray dust or ash which no wind could move. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and dead trunks stood rotting at the rim. Amy Pierce saw it. Amy Pierce is as crazy as Chief Cromwell. Where could I find this Amy Pierce? He still lives up there, out the, the old, old road. road. The one no one uses anymore. Come and blast you. What do you want? Yes, I'm Amy Pierce. Now, what do you... The blasted heath? You mean the gray circle of ground a couple miles up the road? The dead trees? No grass, just gray dust. Dust that doesn't move. You didn't go in there, did you? Good, that's good. You don't want to go stirring around in there. You should leave it. You won't leave it alone just because old Amy tells you to, will you? No, you don't look the type. Then I'll have to tell you about it. Tell you what I can. The Blasted Heath. Heh, <laughs> what a name. That used to be the gardener place. A good big farm. Belonged to Nahum Gardner and his wife, Abigail. They're three boys. That was, uh, uh, back in 83. Forty? No, forty-four years ago. The sum of the meteor fell. Nine feet seven inches. Nine feet seven inches, Professor. Nahum, what have you got here? Morning, Amy. Well, what I've got is every neighbor for miles around trampling through my garden. People I haven't seen in the meeting house since Christmas. All my wife's relatives Hello, and Hello, I... Amy. Hello, Mrs. Abigail. Are you and your sons all right? We're all well. I'll have Merwin take your horse. It's magnetic. Much obliged, ma'am. And the biggest passel of professors and fools I've ever seen. <laughs> Minor diameter, four feet, two inches. And four a two damn big rock in your front yard. <laughs> Another ten feet and you'd be digging a new well. If the Almighty wanted to cave in my well, I reckon his aim would be better. I wish he had. Instead, he's visited me with a plague of... Mr. Gardner! Uh, Amy, uh, this is Professor Duart Ellery of the Miskatonic University. At Arkham. I'm, I'm pleased to meet you. Now, Mr. Uh, Gardner... Uh, Professor, this is Amy Pierce. Yes, owns the farm closest to mine, a couple of miles down the Arkham Road. Professor? Your servant. Uh, Mr. Gardner would like to take a sample of the meteorite. Oh, take the whole blessed thing if you want. I'm afraid we can't do that. It weighs several tons and is still hot. Uh, oddly hot. It should have cooled during its passage through the atmosphere. Oh, then take what you wish, sir. Thank you. Um, if I could trouble you for a bucket. Uh, Thaddeus, uh, get the professor a bucket. Thank you again, sir. Take all Amy, you want, but take it away with you. <laughs> <laughs> the Arkham newspapers made a to-do about the stone. Even one Boston paper sent a reporter. The gardeners were local celebrities for a few days, and there the matter might have ended. But one morning, Nahum decided, against all common sense, the stone in his front yard had shrunk. It now seemed of a size that it might conceivably be dragged to Chapman's Brook and there dumped in. So he threw a rope around the thing and hitched up one of his plow horses. Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa! And it broke. 
As Nehem understood these things, meteors were rock or iron, but this one was oddly soft. It was, in truth, so soft as to be almost plastic. The break revealed a number of nodules, lumps, almost like tumors, oval stony bubbles of an unearthly color, impossible to describe, but not black, not white, so they must be some color, a, a color out of space. Well, Nahum had a hammer fetched and commenced to peck at one of the bubbles, which popped, releasing no liquid or gas, so it must have been hollow, as hollow and empty as Nahum's puzzled mind, until one of his less welcome guests from the day the meteor fell Mr. came Gardner. calling. Mr. Gardner, I've, I've come to ask if Miss Katonic, you might get another sample from the meteorite. Ours appears to have been stolen in the night by some... I, I say... Good, good morning to you, Professor. Uh, what was that? The meteorite. What's happened to the meteorite? It shrank. Meteorites do not shrink. This one did. I repeat, meteorites do not evaporate. This is a priceless scientific artifact, and you... You've been chipping off pieces to sell as souvenirs. What? Zenus, fetch me my shotgun. And you've broken it to boot. Here you go, Pa. Nah. Uh, wait, wait a minute, Gardner. Watch where you point that thing. There's no call for you. There's to, no uh, call uh, for you to call me a liar or to accuse me of being a thief, if that is what you were trying to say. No, 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 not at all. I was merely Get, point get uh, off my land. Don't come back. I'm going. I'm going. Don't you think this is the end of it? It was the end. Of the media, anyway. A thunderstorm blew up that night, and Nahum told me he saw lightning strike the stone six times in a row. In the morning, there was nothing left of the visitor from beyond but a ragged pit by Nahum's well. That was a hot, dry summer. Good for hay. I was busy and didn't see the garden as much. Nahum would invite me to Sunday dinner sometimes, and that was a pleasure. But the gardeners were quieter and seemed more tired than formerly, especially Mrs. Abigail. I found myself excusing my, my unsociability and heading home earlier and earlier in the afternoon. It wasn't just the gardener's oddness. My old horse, Hero, got skittish any time we approached the gardener farm, and if I tried to ride him through their woods after dark, he was well nigh frantic. The last night I tarried at Nahum's, some thing ran across the road in front of us in the twilight. Hero nearly threw me off and bolted right then and there. I kept my seat and calmed him down, but I didn't get more than half a look at what ran under his hooves. Thinking about it later in bed, I decided I did not want more than half a look. When I went hunting up by the gardener's property, I saw fewer tracks than I used to and those somehow strange, oddly laid, or deformed in themselves. Then, one day in July, I was working my north field when the McGregor boys, who I let hunt woodchucks sometimes, came running to me. Mr. Pierce, Mr. Mr. Pierce. Elias, Elias, what, what's wrong? Is someone hurt? No, sir. We, we shot a woodchuck. <laughs> well, that's what you told me you were gunning for. Yes, sir, but what we shot was... Liam, open up the sack and show him. I am, I am. Uh, oh, you boys didn't touch that, did you? No, sir. Elias wrote into his sack with a stick. Oh, good, good. I don't, I don't see how that could walk with its legs like that. I, I don't think it walked like a woodchuck, Mr. Pierce. It was more like on its hind legs when I shot it. Hmm. Can you turn the, the head a little this way? Yes, sir. Ugh. But boys, I want you to go throw that thing into Chapman's Brook. But go to the south end of my property to do it. And toss it well out into the middle. Yes, sir. And boys. Sir? Throw the sack in with it. All that hot summer, Nahum Gardner awaited the ripening of his orchard of apples and pears. He declared he had never seen a finer crop for abundance, size, and gloss. He even laid in more barrels, anticipating the money to be made from the sale of this extraordinary crop. And in August, he was ready to pick. Merwin, reach me down that apple there. Yes, Pa. Oh, ain't she a beauty. I've never seen a redder. And you may have the first bite. Thank you, Pa. <laughs> oh, what is it, son? Uh, get a worm? No, sir. It's nasty, sour. I can't eat it. Don't let me try. <laughs> it's 
towel. Uh, Merwin, ha- hand me down another one. Here, Pa. <coughs> it's the same. What's the matter with him, sir? Oh, it's that damn meteor. It has to be. I just hope it hasn't gotten into the truck garden, too. But it had. Just like the pears and apples into the fine flavor of the melons and tomatoes had crept a bitterness and sickishness so that even the smallest bites induced a lasting disgust. In the end, Nahum had to admit he'd lost the whole harvest and thanked the Lord that most of his crops were in the upland lot along the Arkham Road. If not for them, it would have been a poor winter for the gardeners. For what little... We are about to receive. May the good Lord make us truly thankful. Folks saw little of the Gardner family that cold, iron-hard winter. Their church going was far from steady, and the boys' attendance at the county school had become downright spotty. After Christmas, the Gardners were seen by their neighbors at neither a meeting house nor schoolhouse. No one seemed to want to thrust himself forward to look in on the family in a neighborly fashion. Horses whinnied and tried to bolt anywhere along the road that led by the farm. And even a determined visitor could not be sure of a welcome. Parson, it's so good to see you. Won't you come- Good day to you, sir. We've no need of you here. I still saw them from time to time. I was, after all, their closest neighbor, but even I would have to tie up Hero to the gatepost and walk to the farmhouse. One Sunday afternoon, the last Sunday afternoon I visited, I excused myself while there was still some light in the sky. I had brought over a bushel of apples thinking to be neighborly, but Nahum may have taken it as an insult, seeing that what had happened to his orchards, hardly a word had passed among us. The whole family had an apprehensive air, as if listening for something. I made my excuses and stepped out on the front porch to pull on my coat. Amy? Yes, Mrs. Abigail. I I I wanted to apologize to you, Amy. I've said hardly a word to you, and you were so kind as to come visit. Nobody else does. And you brought those apples. It was nothing, Abigail. Oh, but it was... They were so sweet and clean, not like anything here. And I'm sorry I was so quiet. We were so quiet, but we all have to watch and listen. Listen? Yes. Things are not right. The walls, they they aren't steady, and the trees... Their branches wave even when there's no wind. This is Abby. And the sounds. It's like locusts. And the buzzing. And it almost sounds like someone's... Something speaking. Please, ma'am, calm yourself. I can't sleep at night. Something presses on me and then pulls at me. Oh, Amy, take me away. Take me with you. I'll be a wife to you, please. Just take me with you. Abigail, that that can't be. Amy, we were something to one another once. Before, before I married Nahum. But you did marry Nahum. You've been wife to him for 15 years. Born him three sons. I don't care. I'll die here. It can't be. Get out. Nam, this is not what you think. Get off my farm. Mrs. Abigail's just upset. Merwin, fetch me my shotgun. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Whatever you may think, Nam Gardner, I remain your true friend. And never come back. Seduce her. I'm, I'm going. I backed away from the porch, hands out at my sides until I felt sure, fairly sure, Nam Gardner would not shoot me between the shoulder blades. Then I walked as quickly as I could in the fading light up to the gate to get Hero and home. At the top of the little rise, I looked back and stopped in horror. Yes, the branches of the trees did move, and no, I did not feel any breeze. But there might have been some wind down in the little hollow. There was no natural explanation, though, for the faint, sick glow of phosphorescence that hung over everything around the farmhouse. 
A light of no color I could describe, except that it reminded me of the strange hue of Nahum Gardner's meteor, a color out of space. I mounted Hero and galloped home as fast as he would carry me, far faster than was safe for him or me. That was almost the last time I saw Nahum Gardner. It was the last I saw of his sons, and it was the last time I saw Abigail Gardner as living woman. I did not press myself on the gardeners the rest of that winter, though I thought about them often. On moonless nights, I imagined I could see a faint glow in the sky from the direction of the gardener farm, but it was nothing my eye wanted to linger on. It was a day in late March when I received a caller I had not expected to see again, Professor Dewitt Ellery of the University at Miskatani. Mr. Pierce, good morning. Could I speak with you a moment? It's, uh... Professor Ellery, we met at the Gardner farm the day the meteorite fell. Oh, of course. What can I do for you, sir? Uh, concerning the Gardner family. Uh, Mr. Gardner spoke warmly of you when he introduced you that day. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we have had a falling out since then. In fact, when Nahum and I last parted, he had a shotgun pointed at my back. I see. I have to tell you, you're not the first person to part company with Mr. Gardner in that fashion. <laughs> so I understand. <laughs> then you've not looked in on the Gardners recently. I have not seen them since Christmas time. Ah, uh, then you would not know their state. Uh, myself, I, I have to say I found the farm much changed since the last time I saw it. Uh, Mr. Gardner's orchards and gardens have suffered a reverse since then. Yes, I saw apples and pears hanging unpicked on the trees. Some of the plants and weeds that have grown up in the garden, uh, my colleagues in the botany department might take a look at them. Or that gray crumbling blight that's taken hold of everything. Now, but it's the Gardner family themselves I, I most wanted to ask about. Are they well? I cannot say they are. I saw only two, Mr. Gardner and his youngest son. Merwin. Who screamed the entire time I was there. Screamed? Yes. Well, the oldest boy was at work in the fields, and it goes without saying that we didn't see the middle son. Why does that go without saying? You have the advantage of me, sir. Why, because he's gone mad and is confined to a room in the attic. In the attic? As is his mother. Abigail! I mean, M Mrs. Gardner. I do apologize. I thought you knew. Surely she can't have come to that condition only since Christmas. I assure you, sir, she must have. She was in her right mind, uh, distraught, maybe, when last I saw her. That's surprising. Surprising. She and the boy appear to share a common madness. I must ask you to explain that, sir. Well, as I said, they're confined to separate rooms in the attic. They, they shouted back and forth to each other the entire time I was there. They were calling to each other? I suppose. It was all barbarous gibberish. Very inconvenient. I, I had come to ask Mr. Garner if we could probe the ground where the meteorite fell in search of fragments. I thought you had collected sufficient on the day it fell. And then I thought it had been stolen. After extensive investigation, however, we determined it had not been stolen, but had um, evaporated. Hmm. As Nahum Gardner said. Not to put too fine a point on it, Mr. Pierce, as Mr. Gardner said. Alas, the same fate has overtaken whatever remained of the greater body of the meteorite, too. There's nothing for, more for me to find at the Gardner farm. I thought I heard you say the effects on the plant life were of interest. And I will mention them to my colleagues at the university, but I'm an astronomer, neither a botanist nor a chemist. Hmm, I see. Earthly matters are of no interest to you. I am a man, sir. What's happened to the Gardner family does concern me, but I'm a stranger here. You, you're their friend, or you were. I was and remain, may I'm Gardner's true friend. But his shotgun has been pointed at my back, too. Yet he received me more graciously than I had any right to expect of a man with his troubles. I, I take your point, Professor. Not fully, not yet. Mr. Pierce, more than once in our conversation, he wondered why his good friend Emmy never called any more. He should know why. If he does not... If he does not, then that shows the disordering of his mind more than anything you've said. Then all the more reason you should call on him while you still can. Good day, sir. Yep, you lose. To my shame, I did not call on the gardeners that evening, nor the next day, nor the next. But on the Sabbath, I saddled up Hero and rode to Nahum's farm. 
Even from the gate, it was a shocking sight. Grayish withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines fallen in brittle wreckage from walls and gables, and gray bare trees clawing up at the gray sky as the wind moved them. And even when the wind died, there were no chickens or livestock in sight, and if Nahum's dogs still lived, they must be cowering under the porch, too terrified to bark. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment I thought I had come too late. But from behind the kitchen, I heard the sounds of a shovel striking the earth, and there I found Nahum Gardner digging a grave. Nahum? Hammy? Oh, thank God, Hammy. Help me lower the coffin. I, I'm too weak to do it by myself. Too weak. Nahum, who are we burying? Thaddeus. Oh. My, my son, Thaddeus. He came to him in the attic. This meant to him. I thought Nahum meant that death had come on his son. It was only later that I realized it might be something quite different. Something less clean and merciful than simple death. Nahum... Why isn't your boy Zenus helping you? Zenus? Oh, Zenus lives in the well. In the well. He, he went after Merwin. Is Merwin in the well, too? Uh, Merwin went to get water in the night and uh, didn't come back. Uh, Merwin went to the well and, and Zenus followed him. And I... I led Nahum inside and laid him on a couch, mumbling to himself. The words I could not make out. I let myself out into the yard and walked toward the well, the center point, it seemed to me, of all the evil that had fallen on the gardener farm and on the gardeners. A few feet from the well, crushed and gray, unmoving dust, I found a melted mass of iron which had certainly been a lantern. A bent handle and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, could be the remnants of a pail. There was nothing more, nothing that hinted at the fate of the two lost boys. Back inside, I watched over Nahum a few minutes. Then he asked, Is the fire to your liking? Oh, the room's so much warmer. Zenus brought the wood, you know. In truth, the room needed a fire. It was deadly cold. But there was no fire in the fireplace, only cold black soot. Then I knew the stoutest cord had broken at last and my friend's mind was proof against more sorrow. I wish mine had been. Nam, where is Abigail? Why, 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 she's right here. But, but I think she's grown very feeble. So I would have to find her myself. I took Nam's ring of keys and climbed the stairs to the locked rooms in the attic. Of the four doors in the cramped and lightless hallway, only one was locked. The third key proved the right one, and after some fumbling... I opened the low white door. It was dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by new crude wooden bars. I could see nothing at all on the wide planked floor. There was a stench almost beyond enduring, and I was about to return to the hallway and fill my lungs with breathable air. Then something moved in the shadows in the corner. A momentary cloud darkened the window, and I felt myself brushed by some hateful current of vapor. Strange colors danced before my eyes, and had not a present horror numbed me, I would have thought of the globule in the media. I had no thought for vapors. I had no thought for anything. I heard someone screaming, and only later realized it was me. The thing in the corner, the blasphemous monstrosity before me had the shape of a woman. She had the Almighty. fate of every living thing on the farm. It moved slowly but perceptibly toward me, crumbling as it came, and it spoke. There was a piece of wood in my hand, a scrap from the bars on the window, and I struck and struck and struck. To leave anything moving in that room would have been a sin so monstrous as to damn any man to hell. I remember nothing after that until I was standing out in the dark, stinking hallway again at the top of the stairs. I knew I must take Nahum away from this place and see him fed and cared for. Before I could take the first step down, I heard a thud in the room below. To my terror, I could not move but only listen. There was a heavy dragon and a detestable sticky noise like an unclean sucking. 
I did not dare step either forward or back, but stood trembling at the black curve of the boxed-in staircase until a faint but unmistakable glow in the woodwork, steps, exposed laths, beams began to burn in my eyes, the color out of space. Then there was a rushing noise. I heard Hero, tied by the gate, scream and bolt, and closer, a splash of water. Stealing myself, I went step by step down the stairs until I reached the darkened room below and almost stumbled over what was left of Nahum Gardner. Abby! Oh. Abby! Nahum, what's happened? Nahum, what was it? The thing that had been Nahum Gardner was still alive, in a way, but the horror had been at it. In the last half hour, the graying and disintegration were already far gone, there was a horrible brittleness to it, and dry fragments were scaling off the thing's face and lips. The color, it burns. Cold and wet, but it burns. It, it lifted the well, I seen it, a kind of smoke. The sh well shot at night, sucking the life out of everything. In the stone, it, it must have come in the stone. Poisoned the whole place, that round thing in the stone, I... I, I smashed it. It was the same color. Seeds. Like seeds. They, they grow. And I tried to quiet it, but it, it, it he would not stop. Down your mind. It gets you. It burns you up in the well water. It can't get away. It draws you. You know something's coming, but it ain't no use. Where's my... Abby, Abby. Oh, my head's no good. I, I don't know how long since I fed her. It'll get her if we ain't careful. Her face is starting to have that color. It, it, uh, it, burns. it can't hurt Abigail anymore, ma'am. It can come from some place where, where things aren't like her. Oh, look out, Abby, it'll do something. More. And that was all. That which spoke could speak no more because its face had caved in. I laid a red checked tablecloth over what was left. Then I climbed the slope behind the farmhouse to Nahum's ten-acre pasture and by the north road to Arkham and the police. <laughs> the, the gardeners, the gardener family, dead, all dead. It's in, it's in the well. It's in the well. What's that you said? Something's happened to the gardeners? You yes. mean the meteor man up by Chapman's Brook Road? All, they're all dead. It's, it's in the well, in the well. Said something. Something. Well, we can't go Something's out there tonight, and this man looks like he'd die if we tried it. Put him in a cell, and we'll go see in the morning. That'll be plenty soon enough. No, no, no. The thing in the well, it'll do something else. <laughs> Nahum told me. It'll do something else. That's too late. Did they keep me in a cell? <laughs> uh, of course they did. And as they heard it, somebody had poisoned the garden as well. And who were likely a suspect than their nearest neighbor? Cautious, suspicious men, the Arkham Police Department, but not cautious enough. <laughs> the, the next morning, we all rode out to the Gardner Farm in a Democrat wagon. Me, Chief Cromwell, three constables, and the town coroner, and a big hydraulic pump. They let me stop by my farm to fetch Hero, who had found his own way back to his stall. But Hero would not be ridden past the Gardner's gate. He had to be led and tied securely as did the, the Democrat wagons pair. None of the lawmen had seen the gardener farm before, unless he had come to see the media the day it fell. And it was now much changed. I think that sight drove from their minds the notion that I might have poisoned names well. It would have taken a ton of the deadliest poison to blight his farm that way. First the coroner examined Nahum's body, lying under its checkered shroud in the living room. Two of the constables brought down Abigail's body in an old drop cloth. I made sure I was behind the house, showing the chief Thaddeus' grave when they came. By the well, they set up the pump and began drawing out the foul water. At the bottom, we found the bones of a large dog, a small deer, and Merwin and Zanus. I don't get it. Why didn't Gardner look in the well? There was something about the well, or in the well, that that scared him. Scared him so bad, I guess he wouldn't even look for his sons in it. That's so? Lancey, use that rod to probe the bottom of the well. Tell me if you find anything. Nothing but muck, Chief. Can't touch bottom. Kind of bubbly, funny colors. Hmm. Might be some sort of a gas. 
All right, let's pull him out of there. Are you done, Chief? Will we be leaving? Uh, not quite yet, Mr. Pierce. We need to get that grave dug up so the coroner can take him back to town along with the, the others. <laughs> there might be enough left in the coffin for an autopsy. Are you nervous about something, Mr. Pierce? No, 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 Chief. It's just the, that, well, well, we're getting on into the afternoon. Not a lot of light left. And I have cows that need milking. I'm afraid they will have to wait until morning, sir. I want you here with us. And it's beginning to look like we'll need to stay overnight. Overnight? So that is what I said. Anything wrong with that? No, 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 nothing at all. The light was failing by the time Thaddeus's coffin was dug up and set to one side of the living room. The town men set themselves up in the sitting room, fetched in lanterns, and made a poor supper of what they had brought in the wagon. After they ate, they began to talk until full night had fallen outside. In some wise, the meteor has done this. It must have poisoned the well. Well, how much poison could there have been in a stone and it didn't even hit the well? Could the shock have disturbed some vein of poisonous mineral underground? And that seeped into the well. What poison could make two boys jump into a well and drown? And a dog, and a deer. No, there's something else working uh, here. Gentlemen, if I could interrupt and draw your attention to the window, and the well. A soft beam of light, like a ghostly searchlight, shone up from the well and into the sky. A light of a nameless color, the likes of which I had seen only twice before. The color out of space. What is it, Pierce? What do you know about this? Is this what name Gardner was afraid of? I would have answered. I, I would have babbled out what little I knew, and far more about what I feared, but... I'll go see to the horses. I stopped the driver with a shaken hand on his shoulder. Don't go out there. Nam, Nam said something lives in the well that, that sucks your life out, feeds on every living thing, and gets stronger all the time. He said it must be from way off in the sky. The way it's made, the way it works, it's... It isn't like the ways of God's world. As we stood there, the light grew stronger and the humming louder until one of the constables shouted, Look at the trees! The trees! The trees were not simply moving and swaying without a wind to drive them. Now that the high, bare brow, all the trees in the yard were moving. They were twitching, clawing convulsively at the moonlit clouds. The very bushes and hedges danced obscenely. My God! My God! From the tip of every branch and twig, sparks of unearthly fire glowed, breaking free and soaring into the dark sky. The color out of space and the beam of light from the well grew stronger and stronger, pouring out, not a glow, but a rush of driven vapor. It spread to every living thing here. I couldn't find any bottom in the well, just muck and bubbles. And I feel it like something was lurking. crumbling. They all took away. I never heard horses scream like that. Make them stop! Hero! The light poured from the well, weaving itself into monstrous shapes. But that was not what drove the men in the house to flight. Sweet Lord, look at the walls! Look at the walls! A faint phosphorescence had seeped into the entire room. It glowed on the broad planked floor and the bit of rag carpet. It shimmered over the small paneled windows. It ran up the exposed corner post, flickered down the mantel, and infected the very doors and furniture. Each moment it strengthened, and it was plain that any living thing must leave that house or be taken by the color. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! I knew the house best. I led the flight into the kitchen, but I swear those town men climbed over me to get out. Out the door, the windows, whatever opening appeared before their terrified eyes, so that I lagged behind, climbing up the slope to Nahum's ten acres of clean pasture, and only I stopped to look back. All the farm was shining with that alien color. Trees, buildings, every blade of grass. The tree limbs strained skyward, tipped with tongues of dreadful flame. The same awful fire crept along the ridge poles of the house, the barn, the sheds. Then, without warning, a star of that hideous color shot upward from the mouth of the well like a rocket or a comet, disappearing through the clouds before any man could gasp or cry out. And again, and again... With the third meteor, all the town men had turned to look back. We heard a groaning, cackling down in the valley. Then every tree branch, blade of grass, stick of wood, everything not made of steel or stone, launched itself at the sky, trying in some blind way to follow the meteors. 
and fell back in a jumble as if a gunpowder mine had exploded under the farmhouse. A great silence fell over what had been Nahum Gardner's farm. The chief and two constables went back out to the farm a few days later, but there was nothing to see, not even any real ruins, only the bricks of the chimney, the stones of the cellar, and the circle of gray dust. They never bothered me about it again. It's cursed. You can see where the curse struck. The road by the Gardener farm is abandoned now. There's a new high road as loops away down south to get to Arkham. The old road, the one no one uses anymore. Even the farms along the valley have gone empty. Folks moved away. Bad dreams in the night, they said. A feeling of being watched from the woods and shadows. Mine is the only farm left. No one can make a farm up there. And now, here you are, asking old Amy all sorts of foolish questions, wanting the stories that no one in Arkham or at the university wanted to hear. Why? What's that? A dam across the Miskatonic. A new reservoir for the city of Arkham. And my farm and Nahum's <laughs> at the bottom of a lake. Now, ain't that a prospect? Lean in towards me, son, and I'll tell you something I never told anyone else. That night, that night when all the town men were hightailing it up the hill behind Nahum's farm, they only turned around to look when they heard the colors heading back into the sky. One, two, three. I'll tell you what they didn't see. They didn't see the fourth color. They didn't see the pale star that tried to lift itself out in the well and fell back in. But I saw. Old Dammy saw. That's why the gray circle is still there. Still trying to grow, pushing outward, maybe an inch a year, feeding on the life of whatever it can find. You go tell the people that. They won't listen. They want their new reservoir and their drinking water. So build your dam and don't worry about old Dammy. Nahum was right. The color gets into you. It takes your life while it makes you its own. You can't get away. I can't. I don't want to. Build your dam. There's more life in water than in earth and stone. Feed the color. Feed it on the fish and the snakes and the frogs and the town people in Arkham who drink that water. Feed it until it grows strong, strong as its sisters. And one day, soon, it will launch itself at the stars. And I will go with it. Me and Nahum and his sons and Abigail. I will be, we all will be, the color out of space. Out of Space was written by H.P. Lovecraft and adapted for audio by Ron N. Butler. Featured in the cast were the voices of Alton Leonard as Old Amy Paris, Daniel Taylor as Young Amy Paris, Hal Wiedemann as Nam Gardner, and Claire Whitworth Kiernan as Abigail Gardner. Also heard were the voices of Ron N. Butler, Colin Butler, Neil Butler, David Benedict, Trudy Leonard, Phil Carter, Al Shigutsky, and Daniel Whitworth Kiernan. The show was produced in soundscape by David Benedict and directed by Ron N. Butler. Original music by Alton Leonard. Live Foley effects created by Dina Ameri and Lily. Recorded effects provided by Henry Howard and Audio Craft Studio, performed by David Carter and Brad Weed. Audio engineering was by Brad Zimmerman, David Carter, and Bill Rich. I'm your announcer, the illustrious Miss Kitten. And remember, there is adventure in sound.